Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah to our God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. As we come together this morning, as we think about some of the wonderful things that we have, you know, if we ponder the earth in itself and how upon its axis that it continually spins and rotates and how our God created the things that we have. You know, they say in the beginning, he spoke to everything. He spoke to the waters to separate them. He spoke to the darkness and he made it uh, uh, go into its right places. He split morning. He, he split not morning from uh, night from day. He created the trees. But you know something? What gets me so when I look in the Psalms, he say that we as his people, we were fearfully and wonderfully made, crafted by the thoughts of God, molded the way that he wanted each one of us individually to be, that we would have our individual significance, that he would love us corporately and individually. Oh, what great love that we have. What great love has been stored upon us by an almighty God and by an almighty King. So I would ask you today, join in with me as we give thanks to his name. And Father, we marvel at your greatness today. We marvel at your majesty, O oh God. Lord Jesus, we worship you. We put down everything. We abandon ourselves that we might worship you and praise you. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come in and orchestrate this service today. Have your way with us, O oh God. May that what we offer to you this day be a sweet and a, a sweet and, and savory sacrifice unto you. And Father, Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you will reciprocate to your people and bless us, O oh God, with your presence, O oh God. Let the anointing of God flow upon this place. Let the oil of joy fall upon your people today and may the manifest presence of God overshadow us, oh God. Lord, there will be healings, there will be deliverance, oh God. There will be restorations, oh God. There will be provision, there will be new streams coming to your people today. For we declare it so by your word and we give you thanks in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Let's bless our Lord today, amen.
worship, we 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 worship, we
to remind you that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Come on, say, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And the Lord says he's preparing for you today an opportunity for you to make a decision and a choice to move forward in him. That there has been a place where the enemy has brought up some old tapes, some old thoughts, some old fears. But the Lord says he's reminding you that greater is he that's in you. And he's setting every captive free. He's bringing mercy and grace. And the Lord says this day, this very day, is a day in which he's going to bring you to that place to make a choice to allow him to be renewed in you. Amen. Greater, come on, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Well, let's just give him some praise. If he's in us and he's indwelling us, hallelujah, let him be praised. Cry. 
join with the angels, God. As they fly around your throne, Lord, and cry, holy, 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 holy. So we join them and cry, holy, 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 morning, that his authority, that his life, that his treasures, that his passion and his fire were released through the wind of the flags this morning throughout this atmosphere. And that as we worship this morning and we breathed in what he has released, the Lord says that there is a change coming in how you walk. There is a change coming in how you face your circumstances. There's a wind that will be blowing over you throughout these next three months that will take you to a level of confrontation to the enemy where my authority will be shown, where my life will be breathed out, where my treasures will not just be poured out upon you, but those whose lives you touched, and that my passion and my fire is being renewed at a deeper level, and you listen and you feel the wind of those areas over these next three months, because the Lord says you are being changed yet anew again. In Jesus' name. For is the
Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Audience say that praise is calmly to the upright. Oh, and what a wonderful time that we've had in the presence of the Lord this morning. Amen. God has warmed our hearts and has blessed us. Amen. So as you take your seats this morning in this wonderful atmosphere that we petitioned Holy Spirit to orchestrate our praise and worship, and as always, God is faithful. Good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Alex, and I'm so delighted this morning to have this opportunity to uh, welcome you on behalf of Apostle Buddy and Dr. Mary to the services here at the Life Center uh, this morning. And I want to throw a special shout out for those of you who are joining us by live stream today. We just appreciate you joining as well, and we hope that you be tremendously blessed along with us during the service today. So if you know somebody who's at home and they're trying to uh, worship and praise at Bedside Baptist, tell them to wake up, go online, and join us this morning because we're having a high time in the house of God this morning. Thank you so much. We have our visitors on the internet, but often... In all times, I guess, we have visitors who visit with us and come to the Life Center. So we want to take this opportunity to greet all the, our wonderful guests. And it's a personal thing for me because I believe that everyone who comes through those doors is a gift of God to us from the Life Center. So we want to recognize our gifts this morning. If you're with us for the first time, could you raise your hand so we can see you and love on you a little bit? Amen. Do we have anybody with us this morning? We got some... Some guests, we want to welcome our guests. They're getting up to greet them this morning. Thank you. That is awesome. Thank you. Yes, I told my wife we should have baked some more biscuits this morning. We had guests in the house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nothing warm to her but some good biscuits and some butter and and if you're going to do all that, might well get some ham and throw a little bit of that on it too. Get a little sort, as we say. But hallelujah, God is good. Amen. But listen, to our visitors, what I'd like to say to you is there is a guest card in the seat back in front of you. And we'd really appreciate if you would fill that out for us and uh, hold on to that. Because after the service, uh, we want to meet with you inside of our welcome center that's a special place where we greet our visitors and guests on sunday morning and that's your ticket to enter in so don't let none of the regular members take that into from you okay but also to our wonderful guests uh, there is a, a place for prayer requests on the back of that um, uh, that card we'd really appreciate if you fill that out as well because we want to agree with you in prayer because if you're seeking god we want to agree with you with that amen isn't God good? Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, you know, we want to continue in our worship, and it's time for us to worship by giving God his tithes and our offerings. Amen. So this morning, as you're preparing to give, we got uh, multiple ways to give. You can give by cash. Uh, we call cash Louisiana food stamps. That's where I'm from. So if you want to do it that way, you can give by cash. You can give by check. Just fill the check out legibly. Okay, don't use those hieroglyphics that you're accustomed to use and make it legibly. And, and uh, just uh, fill it out, make it out to Life Center. And if you want to do it by a uh, bank card, just fill the, fill the information out on the envelope. But we need you to put all that information on it, to, as Pastor Sam say, to process your gift effectively. Uh, we want to make sure that you do that, uh, put all the information down, and we need that little code in the back uh, with Pastor Sammy say, that little three-digit code so to process your gift effectively. For those of you who have your bank card, you want to step in the back, there's the giving kiosk, you can do that as well, amen? But listen, while you're preparing your checks, I just want to tell you one thing, if you will. We can only share a lot of times with our testimony. But this morning, if you will, I just want to take a brief second because something happened to me this morning. Uh, and I was worshiping. God reminded me of his goodness and his mercy. We came to Georgia, washed up on the waters of Katrina in 05. And God had me recounting the years that we've been here. And it may be a little bit emotional moment to me, but I want to tell you how good God is. You know, me and my wife were settled. We didn't know what was going on. I had just bought one of the best barbecue grills there is and thought I was going to retire. God thought otherwise. But when we came up here, 
it was, we knew people, but it was traumatic to us. We were starting all over again. We tried to go back to Louisiana, but we couldn't. We just not could get back to the place and things where we wanted to do. But you know something? God was faithful in that because he blessed us. Let me tell you something. When I first came to the church, they asked me, Pastor Alex, would you just help us out? And I started doing that. And you know something? I was processing. Uh, uh, they give the cards, uh, your, your, your giving cards or your envelopes. I had to input those into the church. And you know, one day I was over in the little white house. And you know, I was saying to the Lord, the tears was coming out my eyes. Because I didn't know all of the addresses that was coming. But people, they, they lived in Buckhead or... Uh, 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 Lawrenceville and I look at all of those places and I say Lord me and my wife are staying with somebody say we don't even have an address and every week I say we had a place to live but we don't have none we're staying with somebody and I say don't look like nothing's happening Lord but you know what we did with, without an ongoing job we continually pay our tithes with what we gave what we had and I just kept, just kept doing. But each week, the enemy would tell me, look where you're at. You still ain't got no way. And you ain't going to get no job. You ain't going to have nothing. But I kept going. <laughs> the story is too long. But you ought to see the lovely place that me and my wife have now. We call it Happy Hill. <laughs> Wait, y'all need to get with my wife, get with Elder Case and let her tell you the testimony. We wasn't looking for a place. Somebody called us from Texas and told us you need to look into this. The faithfulness of our God. I had tears in my eyes, but I kept going. I kept trusting in God. But wait a minute. Then the devil told me, you don't have no inheritance for your children anymore. <laughs> Jesus. What you gonna do? See, I doubt. But guess what? I'm at the life center. Guess what I'm doing? I'm still paying my tithes. I still don't see the end and know what God's gonna do. But guess what? I'm minding my own business. I can't do nothing for my daughters like I want to none of my children. But my daughter called me and said, Pops, I want you to call. Come over this weekend. I'm closing on my house. Come on. Guess what? Guess what? No. No. No, listen. 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 You know, they talk about fake news. I don't talk about no fake testimonies. I, I, I can't put it no, so eloquently. All I know is this one thing, <laughs> that my God is faithful. My God is faithful. And let me tell you something. You might be like me today, this morning, but I would suggest that you go back and revisit your check and say, Lord, I heard a testimony this morning, but you continually to give. You continually to trust God. Don't worry about the tears in your eyes, amen, because he's going to dry them up. Amen. He's going to cause you the laughter. So this morning, as we stand and we go into our declarations, we want to boast in the God, the almighty God. They call him Jehovah, they call him, they call him, they call him, they call him, call him what you want him to be to you this morning. He is your Jehovah Jireh, he is your provider, that child is not your provider, but the Lord is your provider.
thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. I'm going to, we're going to do our declarations. But I want you to stand. I just want to hold your hand because I'm going to bless this morning. Thank you, Lord. Father, Lord, you're no respecter of persons. Lord, you demonstrated your goodness and your mercy. You proclaimed it in your word, Father. And Lord, these are your people, Lord God. So, Father, today we bless them. We declare the blessings of the Lord upon them, Father. We declare every dream will come into fruition, O oh God. We, we declare that every promise, O oh God, will be fulfilled, Father. We declare, dear God, there will be fruitfulness, O oh God, for every seed that has been planted among your people. And, Father, Lord God, we hush the voice of the enemy. We say cease and desist right now because the lies that you have been telling the people are don't, Lord, avoid this day because they will be successful they will not fail they will not live in poverty but they will live in prosperity according to the power and authority of your word not our word but your word father and we thank you for it in Jesus name hallelujah now let's declare together amen let's declare together we declare To live and an abundant life in him, the Christ, and declare that we are full of divine wisdom.
media. You know, for weeks, we watched the screens of the announcements uh, for the Envision Conference. Now, it has come and gone, and although we had a wonderful time. So, you know something? Let's take a look at the screens this morning and see what other good things are coming up for us, okay? So you can find something for yourself here at the Life Center. Well, it's that time of year. It's usually around May. We have a lot of things going on, and I think Pastor Samuel uh, has a couple of presentations to make uh, this morning, and I'm looking for him to come through the door. Da, 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 da. Actually, that presentation is for our graduates this morning, and we have some graduates in the house today. Would you all come on down so we can recognize our graduates? I don't have the list in front of me, but if you were, uh, they touch base with you, so here, here comes Professor Na. Da, 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 da. Amen. Well, we want to celebrate our graduates for 2019. We're excited about every level of graduation as it is a place of promotion, not only spiritually, but physically as they are growing in their knowledge and intelligence. We believe that God makes us geniuses in the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So college graduates, Ryan Johnson, are you in the building, sir? <laughs> nope. Okay. He graduated with his uh, MDiv from Mercer University. All right. We're going to drop down to the lowest age now. Josiah Asbury, who graduated from kindergarten. So we celebrate Josiah. Amen. Fifth grade graduates, we have Jemiah Woodruff, Jordan Chappelle, Dar, Marsa, 
and Alexis Roberts. Are you here? No? Dawe, I'm sorry, Dawe. Are you here? Come on up. Yes. I'm so sorry. Come on. Yeah. All right, our eighth grade graduates, Samarian Bond, Michael Cruz, Destiny Harris, Dynasty Harris, Xavier Lewis, and Daniel. You will come on up. Awesome. Cool. So we're just going to proclaim some blessings over you as they bring your gifts. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Come on, Josiah. <laughs> Amen. If you will stretch your hands towards them, stand by your baby. Father, we thank you and we honor you for each and every life you have represented here. We thank you that they are the gift to the future and that you have anointed them, Father, to be the leaders that you have called them to be. So, Father, we just proclaim over them that no fear or anxiety, no form of insecurity or unworthiness will be their portion. But, Father, they move in the power and confidence of knowing who they are in you. We thank you for their identities being secure. Even as they move to the next level, we thank you, Father, that you promote them, not just in what they do, Lord God, but, Father, I thank Thank you for promoting their wisdom, knowledge, understanding, giving them the ability, Lord God, to have analytical insight into how to process information. I thank you for anointing them scholastically. I thank you for bringing forth, Lord God, in their scholastic endeavors, Father, promotion, as well as favor in the days to come. I thank you that they will write, Lord God. I thank you for this grace, this scribe anointing that is on this group, that they would write essays, Father, that will cause there to be attention in their direction, Father. We thank you for awarding them and rewarding them, even for the labor of their parents. We decree in the name of Jesus that they will prosper and advance, Lord God, in every level of advancement in their schooling. We thank you for what you're doing to protect them. No bullying shall come near them. We thank you, Father, that they shall walk under the guard of you with angels accompanying them everywhere that they go. We honor you, Father, that you will keep them safe from all violence, all danger, all hurt, all harm. We thank you for the victory of God that is upon them and that they shall walk in the knowledge of you as witnesses in the earth. We bless them now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, and amen. Let's celebrate them real big. Good stuff. Amen, amen. You may go ahead and back to your seats. Praise God for our children. Amen. Hallelujah. We're blessed. Amen. And now it's time for us to, to uh, uh, allow our children to go to their respective places for the day so they can get some uh, learning that's tailored for them. And uh, uh, for our visitors and guests, we have uh, one through three-year-olds out the door to my right over there in the nursery area. Uh, Pre-K through... what? Is, uh, Pre-K through first grade will be out the door, out the door upstairs in room 206. And in 202, uh, we will have second through fifth grade that's out the door on this to my left-hand side upstairs. And today from sixth through 12th grade will be downstairs in the social hall for our children. And we thank God for them. May they have a blessed time today. Amen. And we just pray for those who work with our children. May God strengthen and enrich their lives as well. We had a wonderful week. We had an outstanding week. We had a powerful week. We've been blessed. We've been renewed in our uh, dreams, uh, uh, looking for our dreams and respecting the visions and things that we get to hold on to them for God. But now we're starting off again. Amen. We're, we're on our way to another week here in the house. And today, uh, what we have, uh, we have our speaker today who's known as a demon assassin. Uh, he's known for assassinating demons, amen. He's known one to be laborers in prayer and labor in prayer and will cause you to labor in prayer if you're around him. He loves the word of God. He's a perceiver. He don't like the, the cloudy areas. He likes it black and white, amen. And so one of the things is, is that 
Uh, he always has a fresh word of the Lord upon him. But today we're going to hear from our own Pastor Samuel Giles as he comes, blesses us with the word of the Lord today. Won't you receive him as he comes? Come on, let's celebrate the name of our God. Let's celebrate Jesus real big. He is worthy. He is holy. He is high and lifted up. We honor you, O oh God. You may have your seats in the presence of the Lord. We celebrate the Lord for what he desires to do today. It's an honor and a privilege always to stand before you. We honor Apostle Buddy and Dr. Mary Crum, founders, co-founder of this house, our senior leaders. Amen. We celebrate them and all that they are establishing continually in the house of God. I celebrate my help, my wonderful wife, Pastor Ayana Giles. Amen. <laughs> I love her, she is suitable for me, amen, and I'm glad to have her by my side on this journey, amen. Well, we're gonna turn in our Bibles to Ephesians chapter one. We're gonna read a little bit today, is that all right? Okay, all right. So we're gonna start at verse three and go through verse 12 and then pick up at verse 15 through 21. And it reads, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, just as he chose him before the foundations of the world, that we, would, we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise and glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and are which on the earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, underlying counsel of his will, that, he, that we who first trusted in Christ would be the praise of his glory. Verse 15, therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that your love for all the saints do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, that the, that the God far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Father, we thank you for the release of your word in this house. We thank you for the authority of your truth. We honor you, Lord God, that you are the sovereign, preeminent one, and we submit wholeheartedly to what you desire to do in this room. Father, we yield ourselves, Lord God, completely as vessels that desire to be poured in by your spirit, and we thank you for the truth of your word, Father, that will set us free and bring us into greater encounters with you. We give you honor, and we thank you, Lord God, that your purposes shall rule and reign in our lives above anything else in Jesus mighty name amen amen and amen so I want to talk to you from the subject of purpose over preference as we have come through this conference we know that the Lord has spoken many things about opening the eyes of our understanding causing us to have new vision new new perspective new understanding about what it is that he's doing even for us to be able to see him in a way that we've never seen him before one of the things that we have to remember is that every time there's a fresh revelation, there is another move of God. 
Whenever there's a fresh revelation for another move of God, there are new ways for us to do what it is that he's called us to do. Many times we go backwards and we usually get used to the way that we are set in as people that are creatures of habit. We find a way that we're used to hearing from God and we get in that vein and we stay right there. And we find ourselves sometimes tripped up by the very nature of what we begin to walk in. Because when God does a new thing, what he usually does is the very thing that you've got comfortable with, he changes. And the Lord is bringing us, even as we're coming through this conference with new eyesight and new perspective, he's bringing us into a place where he wants us to understand, first and foremost, his original intent for everything that he has called us to do and to be in the earth. A lot of times we get caught up with just the doing, and we forget that he's called us more than anything to be his sons and daughters and to have intimate relationship with him above anything else. Too many times in the body of Christ, we find that we get busy in the busyness of church and we find ourselves losing the first love, the place of our relationship with him. And it becomes cumbersome to some degree. And we find ourselves hurting and wounded and actually just going through the motions as opposed to him being the one that we desire more than anything. Whenever God begins to change our whole viewpoint about what he's about to do, he's saying, come up here higher. Come and learn of me all over again. I don't want the old way of you doing things the way that you have been doing it. I don't want the same prayer time. I don't want the same level of worship. I don't want the same level of consecration. I don't want the same level of giving, but I want you to be sensitive to me all over again because what busyness has the power to do is to make us desensitized to his presence. And the Lord is trying to bring us back into the place where we are sensitive to his very move. That when he walks in the room, everything else shuts down. All attention shifts in the direction of what he's doing. We can be in mid-conversation and feel the presence of the Lord enter in and stop and give the moment to hear the instruction. He's bringing us into a place where we're learning him all over again. We know at the same time that whenever there is the introduction of a new encounter with the Lord, there is always the opposing force that arises. Because the work of the enemy is always to hijack a move of God. When Adam came forth in the earth, the earth had not felt the authority of that man ever before. Only thing it had felt was the move of the spirit upon the face of the deep. But then one stepped on the scene and abided in the earth with the same level of might, the same level of power, the same level of authority. And the earth quaked literally at the very sound of Adam's voice. When he spoke, things came into alignment with their purpose. Immediately, there was the download of what a lion was supposed to do. Immediately, there was the download of what the elephant was supposed to do. Immediately, there was the download of every single creature in all of the earth and they had their timetable in which they were to function everything budded at the right time everything gave its fruit at the right time everything was tended in the garden properly by the decree of his mouth and he had an authority that literally caused things to align and shape according to the will of the father because there was no separation between him and God but as he walked in the earth here comes the enemy here comes the jealous one here comes the envious one that says, now let me interrupt the very connection that this one has with God and let me do it by the subtlety of a suggestion. And in the midst of the subtlety of the suggestion, it changed Adam's heart posture. Whenever there is a change in heart posture, your preferences come along with it. What do I mean by that? When he spoke to Adam and said, Adam, did not God say? And Adam was like, okay, I've been in the garden with this fruit the whole time. I've seen this tree the whole time. And my perspective towards the tree was that it was off limits, untouchable. I can't mess with it because it would interrupt my fellowship with the Lord. But with one suggestion, his preferences change. And when his preference changed, he put his preference above purpose. And in his preference being above his purpose, he actually abdicated the authority of the position that God gave him in the earth. The enemy brings suggestions at the next level to try to move you out of the position of your authority so that he can rob you of everything God commissioned for you to have. He knows that he can do it if he could just get you into a place where your heart desires the wrong thing. Come on now. You find it where there's not even a place where you had a history of that desire. 
He had no history of that false desire in his life at all. But as soon as the suggestion of the enemy, as soon as the word came, hey, why don't you take a look at that? He started gazing upon it. Now, this is a key principle. Wherever your eyes are set upon, your desires will follow. Amen. Wherever your eyes are set upon, your desires will absolutely go in the direction of what you gaze upon. It is the principle that God put inside of us as men that when we looked upon God himself and we looked at him face to face, we desired him more than anything else. It was the principle that set, up, set us up to actually be sons in the earth. That there would be the same authority, the same image, the same likeness clothed upon us that we could actually do what scripture says. Put on Christ Jesus as a robe and when the enemy looks he doesn't see two people in the earth. He actually sees Jesus and Jesus alone. I know that's a little hard for us to conceptualize. But the very fact that we are supposed to come into the fullness of perfection in accordance to Ephesians 4 and 11, it talks about how the fivefold ministry is released in the earth so that there may be the perfection of the saints to the what? To the fullness of their working of the ministry, but that they come into the full knowledge of God and to the perfect man. Who is the only perfect man? Christ Jesus himself. So there is an image that is born inside of us that we're supposed to press towards so that what? Our preferences align with his desires for our life. In a very small but detrimental conversation, Adam gave up everything. Lost out on the fullness of his authority. Lost out on eternal life. Actually being able to walk in the earth and his body not decay. He invited death by a change of preference. Hear me in this. When the Lord is preparing us for graduation, for increase, for the next level of desire and passion in him, he will change our preference to hunger higher. Speak those things that are what? Above. We hunger higher as opposed to looking at those things that are among us in the earth. But a lot of times what we do is that we grow complacent when we receive a fresh download from heaven. Why? Because we feel like we made it somewhere. Okay, is anybody else going to be honest? We feel like that we've accomplished a thing, so we pull back a little bit, right? We feel like, okay, we're growing with God, we're moving, and sometimes that very hunger that he's put inside of us to push to the next level keeps us in a place of stagnancy, and we begin to slow down. Physically, momentum is the hardest thing to regain after it stopped. You actually have to build up a double the amount of force to create the same momentum that you had at one point in time. And so the enemy comes to slow us down by the things that we begin to desire. The Bible tells us, he that hungers and thirsts after what? Righteousness shall be filled. It's a promise. It's a decree of the Lord to our lives. But we see that whenever there is a place that we have access to the authority and to the greatness of what God wants to pour, there is demonic systems that are set up to actually hijack us and to keep us from moving into those open doors. 2 Corinthians 11, 3 through 4, and I'm going to read this to you so you understand what a demonic system looks like. But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit. Now hear me, familiar spirits are rampant in the earth. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in a second. A different spirit which you have not received or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Meaning that you would actually accept it and receive it. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. The Bible talks about the last days being which that God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. But he also talks about this warfare, this strategy of hell to produce this false image of leadership and authority that would try to function and operate in pseudo aspects to function like they are of God. But at the end of their hearts is wicked and demented and dark and it goes to turn you away from the things of God. Now, this is the subtlety. The Bible says that even the very elect will be fooled. So if our hunger is not in constant pursuit 
of the truth of God in us, that desire, that passion, that, that zeal, that run, that, that ability, that drive, it does, does not keep us before his face. Our preferences will start to shift to subtly. Things start causing us to slip. Next thing you know, we look up and we're in a place that we never thought we would be. This is the warning for us that the enemy desires to present us with things that will actually keep us nullified when it comes to the kingdom of God. At the same time that God is presenting some things before us that we've never seen before, we have to what? Be able to discern between the two and actually walk in what is good and not evil to make sure that we're perfecting the fullness of holiness in the what? Fear of the Lord. Now hear me. Holiness is not just what you don't do. It's actually what you do do. It's actually you pursuing in worship. You're like being poured out as a drink offering before the Lord where he delights in you and you delight in him and it becomes the relationship that actually gives you benefits and access into the realm of the spirit that actually allows you to talk with him daily, to engage with him with the fullness of your senses, with every aspect of who you are. Some people have seen images of God. Some people have heard the voice of God. Some people have smelled the fragrance of his robes, which the Bible actually talks about. It talks about his smell like kasha, kasha, hyssop, cinnamon, myrrh, all of that. And some have sensed him in that presence, right? But how many of us have been limited? And most of it by other things that are clogging up our gateways, keeping us from being able to access the fullness of who he is. Those gateways get clogged when we find other desires to fill them, as opposed to asking, Lord, I've never seen you. Why not? What's keeping me? What mindset is blocking me? Because you said that you desire for us to behold the beauty of who you are. That we would, what, abide in your presence. It was the cry of David's heart. And I believe that the cry of David's heart is always, when we find his aspect of worship, is for the entire body. Why? Because God created a whole system of worship behind David and what he created in the temple. It was the tabernacle of David, worship 20 and 4-7. It went around the clock. He staffed worship to make sure that there was the intimacy that was birthed out of that place. That every single person that came would encounter the fullness of the presence of God. So we find that when there is a message that is being released to us, that hell wants to hijack, there has to be a, a place that we're on guard to make sure that we don't give anything up to the enemy just haphazardly. And I know you're saying, okay, Pastor Sam, you're talking a lot about us releasing things, but let me give you a for instance. Time is the most valuable thing that you have in the earth, right? But when there's messages or there is a release from God, what happens is that in the midst of it, the enemy tries to frustrate your time more than anything else to keep you out of the presence of God so that you what cannot hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. He will clog your hearing, clog your emotions, clog your mindset with so many things that you're so busy about that you actually miss the visitation of the master passing by. Wow. It's the Martha syndrome. It's the place where there is so much going on and then you look up and you realize, whoa, wait a minute. The father has been here and I have missed him. Can I just be honest with y'all? All right. I lost about a month recently and I was like, Lord, wait a minute. Hold up. Time out. This is not supposed to happen. My emotions and my mind and, it, and the frustration was just so great that I lost a month. Where I looked up and a month had passed and I, I was like, Lord, I haven't been tracking with you in my normal standard. Like, Lord, I've missed the very intimacy of your heart towards me. I can't even give an account for the days that have gone by in this month. Why not? And I realize this is the warfare of when God is trying to shift your season. In the midst of transition, you have two of three options. You can either stay where you've been, you can get stuck in the middle, or you could press headlong into the unknown and actually experience what God has for you, even though you don't even know what he's describing it to be. All you know is by faith, I'm going with you. It is the place that God is trying to prepare us that we are what? Able to navigate these sensitive places with him. Because why? He wants to transition us even as, I believe it was, yes, it was, uh, it was Apostle Jane Hammond that was talking about the quantum leap. 
that we're going from here to here with no in between. It's an instant shift. When that instant shift happens, you can't be lagging. Amen. We cannot, in our efforts, be in a place where we're actually trying to move with him, and he's like, come on, catch up. And we're like, nah, I'm good. I don't want to spend time with you today. You can actually miss the appointment of the Lord. That's going to change everything about your life. We do not want to miss that. We can't afford to miss it. When God is shifting in a house, an entire house, that means everybody that's a part of that house is shifting at the same time. Now, we know throughout the body that happens, people get left, some people run ahead, some people get comfortable where they are. But when God is trying to change you, he deals with your appetite. He deals with what you desire. Let's talk about the definition of preference real quick and then we'll move into some other things. All right? Preference by definition is the act of preferring a thing or giving an advantage or a desire for one thing more than the other. All right? The state of being preferred. It is the power or opportunity of choosing. One that is preferred. It is the act, fact, or principle of giving advantages to some over others. Lastly, it is the priority in the right to demand and receive satisfaction of an obligation. Our preferences in the sense of how it's been functioning and how we've been talking about has been for us to actually make sure that purpose remains the preeminent thing. And let's talk about it, how the fathers of Israel, we see that they actually fell into a place where they did not allow purpose to remain the key thing. I'll read to you Jeremiah 16 and 12, and it says, And you have done worse than your fathers, for behold, each one follows the dictates of his own evil heart, so that no one listens to me. The Bible tells us that our heart is exceedingly wicked. It's desperate when it's left to its own devices. But when our heart is constantly placed in the hand of the Lord, every single morning we cast our crowns at his feet. We lay our hearts before him and we say, Father, create in us a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. We cry out, even though we may not even be in a place where we feel like that we have uh, mis mis misguided or misstepped our way. Where we feel like we may not have had sin. But when you realize how desperately wicked the flesh can be, your heart cry is, Father, make me like you. Let my heart cry after you. Let my heart desire what you desire. Let my heart be transformed in your presence so that I can what? See correctly. If our hearts are off, then everything we view will be off. If our preferences are in a different direction, everything that we do will be in a different direction. The dangerous part about this is that we are a prophetic people in a prophetic house, right? Jeremiah 23, 17 says, they continually say to those who despise me, the Lord has said, you shall have peace. And to everyone who walks according to his own dictates of his own heart, they say no evil shall come upon you. They are actually contradicting the word of God. And God is saying, hey, I'm not saying that. I have not, verse 20, I have not, 21, I'm sorry. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they stood in my counsel. And had caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. As a prophetic people, the voice of God comes to us as those who carry the future in our hearts and our minds. The Bible says, of course, concerning prophets, I will do no thing in the earth unless I reveal it first to my servants, the prophets. But what happens when the prophets are corrupt? Our future is under assault. So we, as the people of God who desire to hear his voice, it is our mandate to actually be carriers of the voice of God. We have to make sure what all channels remain pure so that the voice can come through us into a place where it ministers to the whole entire city. See, God is elevating us, right? We've been used to making change concerning, you know, our region right here. People come to Life Center to be trained and equipped, right? But what happens when kings show up here? What happens when presidents show up here? What happens when heads of state call and say, listen, we need to hear from God and the Lord said for us to come here. Now, it's not far fetched because we had people who came all the way from China that the Lord said, go here. They were going to Apostle Maldonado's CAP conference and the Lord said, go to this little church called Life Center in Dunwoody. 
They had never heard of us, came from China and came here, received the word of the Lord that changed their entire ministry and their lives. He desires to use this house to be a change agent for things in the world to shift according to the word of God in an instant. But he has to make sure that we are a people who are ready. He doesn't want to do it just for those who are sitting in the office. But what happens when an entire body moves into a place of governmental authority where now we speak with the oracles of God or as the oracles of God and that our mouths bring shaking in the earth because the decree of the Lord can be trusted to a people who have found him to be the only desire of their hearts. It is the place where we become untainted. We can't be bought. We can't be used. We can't be manipulated. We've actually allowed the Lord to change our hearts to the point in the place that he delights in what he sees. And then he breathes upon our hearts that actually the very desires of our hearts he doesn't mind giving to us. I know a lot of us, we pray that prayer, we decree that scripture that the Lord will give us the desires of our hearts if we delight ourselves in him. But I think that we've done a very poor job of looking at what delight looks like to him. Come on. Come on now. We treat him like we delight in ice cream totally different thing. Our delight in the Lord is to delight not only in his face and his hand, but to delight in his ways. It means, Lord, change me. I want to be like you. There is no other standard that I'm giving before myself, but you alone are the standard that I'm looking at. And I say, until I hear the delight of you saying, well done, son, you are walking as my image and my likeness in the earth. I will not stop pursuing the place that you take delight and joy in me. It's for all of us. All right. So when we have preferences that are contrary to the truth of God, we find ourselves outside of present truth. That's how people actually end up non-relevant. They become irrelevant in the, in the sake of the body of Christ. Why? Because they got used to a mode of operation. And they didn't shift in their present preference to actually desire the new thing that God was doing. They remain in a place where they kept doing the same thing over and over and over again where God is saying, hey, I'm trying to upgrade you. I'm trying to change the way you function with me so that how you operate in authority changes as well. But when we stay in our rut, this is what the Bible says. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. A lot of us just get stuck at death physically, but what happens when your ministry or your relevance or your, your seek of revelation actually dies? When it withers, all of a sudden now your voice that used to be prominent and full of authority now is impotent. There is no fresh oil pouring out of you. Why? Because you actually forgot to go to the source to get fresh oil. So now your oil has become rancid. It's in a place where it's outdated. It's in a place where you have flies and other things that have polluted the oil. And now all of a sudden, those who needed the salve and the anointment to be upon their lives for them to be healed, you, you lack the very issue to be able to heal them. The Bible says they that are spiritual, what? Restore such a one that has fallen. So let's talk about what happens. Because David realized that if my truth is off, that everything about my nature is going to shift as well. David was off concerning the realm of his authority, the sphere of his authority. He actually took on the authority as if he was God. And he killed a man, all because his preferences shifted in a direction that it shouldn't have. And when he repented, he said, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Then he cried out, Lord, I desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden places make me to know wisdom. The fear of the Lord is what the beginning of it. So restore me back to the fear of the Lord. Restore me back to the sensitivity that I seek your truth above my own. How many people have actually argued based on their truth? And it backfired on you because your truth was not the actual full truth. But when our hearts desire truth in the inward parts, we actually find a place where our preferences align with the truth. So what are our preferences driven by? Our preferences are driven by successful seasons, painful experiences, disappointments, and culture. 
four areas that the Lord gave me. Successful seasons, let's talk about that for a second. A lot of times when we find ourselves successful in a thing, we stay in the same vein of doing that over and over and over again, believing that that's the only way that it's actually supposed to be done. We find ourselves praying the same prayer, actually working miracles the same way, praying for every miracle the same way, getting outdated in our methodology concerning deliverance as opposed to inquiring of the Holy Spirit about each and every situation so that we do it according to his direction. We get in a rut because those successes actually drive us into a methodology of doing something. Moses was victory, victim of doing the same thing. He struck the rock the first time according to the word command, and guess what? Water came out of it. But the second time, the decree to him and the methodology was speak to it. But what? He struck it again, and it cost him. Why? There was an upgrade that was available to him that he actually refuted. So he fell in the same vein as Esau. When it came to a first actually principle of a thing, God wanted Moses to actually have that birthright to speak to a thing and it shifts, to speak to a mountain and actually have the mountain obey what it is that's coming out of his mouth. But he missed the opportunity and because he looked at it as being something less than, God said, oh, there's a payment that you have to pay for that. The scripture says, Esau, I hate. Jacob, I loved. But Jacob got the name of the supplanter. His error was not having more value for the birthright. His error was how he went about to get it. That was his error. But his value for the birthright set him up to receive it because what? There was a disvalue that was in the life of the one that was supposed to receive it. Hear me in this. When Miriam did the same thing, she disvalued her position. Why? Because she said, I hear from God too. How many times do we function in that role? Oh, I hear from God. I prophesy. I prayed and made sure that people were protected. I prayed and saw healing in people's lives. And then we go rogue. Not knowing that there is a consequence when the enemy finds you out of order. Why? Because he knows that God's judgment has to come to what's in disorder. His blessing comes upon order, but his judgment comes upon disorder. Why? Because he has to right the ship. Because of the fact that when you're walking in a level of influence, Pastor Alex... It is the place of your leadership. It is the place that actually people are watching you. You don't realize that you think that you're just a believer that's sitting as a lay member on the pew, going through your daily experience, but I guarantee you, you have at least five people watching your walk, making sure that you actually are who you say that you are. And so when you actually function in something that is contrary to the will of God for your life and the promise of his actual testimony and you bring disjustice to his name, it has to be repented swiftly. Why? Because when you repent, you come back in the right alignment and then the God himself can speak on your behalf when the accuser comes before him daily to accuse you for the things that you've done contrary to his will. So we find, though, that the very thing that entered into Miriam's heart was not just about her preference. But most times when we set a preference and we're fixed upon it, we actually enter into a prejudice dangerous thing. We actually prejudge the thing that's not what we have preference towards. If we like a certain group of people, we actually like that group of people and everybody else, we shun. Amen, somebody. Y'all know y'all do it in the church. Amen. You got people that you actually hug and then others that you just give them a wave or a pat. Amen. And when we don't realize what our preferences are doing or we don't allow the Lord to be what? Lord over our preferences. We will actually set a prejudice and it will cause us to think off about somebody or something actually contrary to what the Lord has to say. We block our ability to hear at the next level. We cannot be hard in our fixation against things that God is not hard in his fixation about. Sometimes we've actually set a wall against the very thing that God has sent as a blessing to your life. He has some things lined up that you never thought the package it would come in, it came in. And because you've prejudged it, you actually miss the value of what it means to your life. 
We have to allow our preferences to what? Be under the hand of the Lord so that what? We posture ourselves that our heart is in the hand of the Lord and he can turn it whithersoever he will. If we do not allow our senses to remain in that place, actually what we end up doing is taking control of our senses and we direct it based on old information. We go by an experience or a success. Let's talk about painful experiences. Jonah is a prime example of someone who allowed a painful experience to actually navigate his destiny. He said to God, God, I've seen a side of you that most people don't talk about. I've seen your redemptive nature. And because I see that you are a redeemer, you actually will give a, a moment to the people of Nineveh. Those who have killed my, my fellow countrymen, those who are worked to warfare and to bring terror and, and trauma and everything against my people for generations. You're actually going to give them an opportunity to say yes to you. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to run in the opposite direction. How dangerous is it that an entire nation was in the hand of a man that chose based on his preference to forfeit purpose in order for preference to remain? You had an entire people that at the sound of the voice of the prophet, they said, Lord, we are sorry. The king called an entire fast, put on sackcloth and ashes and called the kingdom to a fast that they would come back into alignment with God. And God relented in his judgment. But how many times do we operate based on our pain and say, God, but they did this to me. They did that to me. They don't deserve your redemption. They don't reserve, deserve another chance to get it right. They don't deserve this opportunity for you to make things right in them so that they can make things right in the earth. Because guess what? Repentance is, repentance is not the only thing you need to do to make it right. Amen. Amen. If you do something against somebody, you just don't repent to God and keep it moving as if that person wasn't affected. But if you're going to do it right, you actually go to the person and you repair it there. And if you open your mouth to anybody else, you go and repair it with the people that you opened your mouth to. This is the power of how God brings healing to the body of Christ as a whole. We have too many fissures in the body, too many cracks, too many uh, places of brokenness in the midst of his body. All right. So we find where the children of Israel, they allowed the pain of Roman rule to mask what it is that they needed to discern about the Lord Jesus Christ being with them in the earth. Why? Because they look for a Messiah that would do something totally different. They look for one who would overthrow Caesar and overthrow Rome. But actually, the decree was, John said, when he saw him, the Lamb of God, who takes away what? The sins of the world. What's greater, to overthrow a kingdom or to actually take away the sins of an entire world? They miss the greater thing by keeping their eyes in the direction of their pain. God was trying to introduce them to another side of who he was to the point that Jesus had to weep when he walked past Jerusalem and said, they did not discern the time of their visitation and they're missing me and they're going to have an effect and a cause and a consequence because they did not know what it was to engage with the one who was their salvation. We find that as those things happen, disappointments enter in. And when disappointments enter in, it can actually affect the way that you see everything. When Samuel anointed Saul, Saul was supposed to be king. He was supposed to be God's chosen, and he was God's chosen. But in his actions, he failed the hand of God. He failed to obey. And Samuel took it and went into a place of grief. He was in bitter anguish over the life of this man. Why? Because it was like Saul was his son. It was like he was a, a protege of his that actually turned and went astray. And Samuel held on to it. Why? Because there was a place that there was a fixation upon what he saw to be the actual thing that God desired. So when it came for him to actually anoint another one, God had to actually break him out of depression. How long will you mourn over Saul? I have found another one who is after my own heart. Rise up, take the oil, and go anoint the next king that I have selected. But when he got there, his methodology was the same. He looked for a representation that looked like Saul as opposed to looking for the next move of God that was going to be however the Lord described him. And the thing that got me that he never inquired of the Lord, what was this man supposed to look like? He had already fixed in his mind that he must look like Saul because I've had a representation of what that's supposed to be. So we find that, yes, prophets can fall victim to it. 
The entire body can fall victim to it. And the Lord is trying to prepare us that we will not miss what he's desiring to do. We find where the rich young man who came before the Lord was right in his actions. When God said to him, Jesus was like, you know, I need you to carry all of the commandments, be able to walk these things out. He said, Lord, I've been able to walk those things out since I was a child and not miss one. The Lord said, good, but this one thing you lack, go take all of your wealth, everything you have, sell it and now give it to the poor. And he walked away disappointed. Why? Because he put more value in the preference of being wealthy, having prestige, having those look upon him as being one that led in the midst of the, the, the culture or the city that he was in. And he actually missed on what was greater. The Bible doesn't even tell us that he came back to the reality of Christ. He walked away and what? He shunned or abdicated the place of access that God was trying to give him to actually be a disciple. He could have been one of the 12. Think about that. He forfeited his destiny to be paid. How many of us are on the borderline of forfeiting our destiny for what is revenue, what is income? What is supposedly something that's going to increase our value in the earth, but we're missing the thing that's going to completely set us apart. The disciples were, were what? By definition, the set apart ones. God is trying to set us apart as a house, as a people, as individuals. But it's going to require us to lay down the very thing that our heart feels like we desire or need in order to go after the thing that is greater. Our preferences can cause us to be unaccepting and stubborn to the moves and the directives of God. And if there's stubbornness there, guess what? The Bible says that there is idolatry because we feel that we got the better way. And God is trying to say, hey, there is a way that I have actually made for you. Not anybody else, not your degree, not your family lineage, not your career. There is a way that I have made for you. And that if you would just come with me, let me download into you what you need to hear. Let me change your preferences so that you can desire something else. And I'm going to say this prophetically. There are many of you in here that you have been locked into your career at one level. And the Lord is saying, I am trying to upgrade your viewpoint of how you see yourself. For promotion is not in the hands of man. But the Lord decrees even now, promotion is in my hands, saith the Lord. And I will increase you supernaturally. Many of you have been walking in a place of lack, in a place of frustration. All because your viewpoint was not corrected concerning what I've said about you, say of God. But if you shift yourself today. If you allow the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened and to see yourself the way that I see you, there is a promotion that is coming and there is a weight that you will carry in the earth of influence and authority. Even as you speak, your mouth shall command attention wherever you go. Set yourself in alignment, saith the Lord. As you do so and as you believe in me, I will cause my favor to run you down and overtake you and promote you into a place of authority, might, and influence according to my plan. If you receive it, go ahead and give him praise. I'm talking about suddenly's about to happen. Suddenly's are about to happen. <laughs> Lastly, we find ourselves where culture can actually shift our perspective and our preferences into desiring something that God never intended. We fall victim to the God of the age when we allow culture to actually bring us into a place where we're saying, hey, it looks like everybody else is having a little bit more fun out there. Maybe it doesn't take all of this. Maybe I'm fasting too much. Maybe I'm praying too much. Maybe I'm reading my word too much. All my friends are going to the movies. All my friends are going and do it. And I have no problem with going to the movies. I have no problem with entertainment. But guess what? If God is putting a demand on your time, there is a place that he's trying to get you to that you can't afford to miss the appointment. I can't afford to miss the appointment. Because all of it is for a greater glory that he's trying to birth in us. Many did not believe. In Jesus, nor did they believe that Jesus could fall upon the Gentiles and bring them into a place of shifting because the culture said that they were less than. 
One of the things that God is going to deal with specifically in this house is yet still that undercurrent of prejudicial issues, both ethnic as well as social economic. The Lord is about to deal mightily with it. And wherever there is prejudice within any of our hearts, he's about to bring it to the forefront. He's going to let us see where we have gotten complacent and we've not gone all the way through. He wanted and desired from the very beginning to use this house as a light and as a image for the world to actually follow when it comes to bringing reconciliation and wholeness. And the Lord is going to shift this house into a place where the love of God is about to break in like a mighty hammer. And wherever the love of God is absent, you're going to find that hearts are going to be revealed. You say, Pastor Samuel, why am I talking about the love of God? The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave, that means every tribe, nation, tongue, every class of people, the poor, the indigent, everybody that was broken, everybody that was in a different mindset concerning even their mental health. The Lord is bringing a place of love that we're going to actually value those that he has put his hand upon that he's breathed into their lives and called them to be souls in the earth he has put his blood and his name upon that very person and we have no ability to sit back and act as if they're second class citizens it is a disgrace to God and he's shifting our hearts that we can't look down as people as being servants Everybody in their own respective places, you are a servant of one. The Lord Christ Jesus himself. If you serve other people in the body of Christ, it is a blessing. Why? Honor remains there. But guess what? You're still doing it as unto who? So those who are being served, you have no right to look down at anybody. I have no right to look down at anybody. But I must value the gift of God that is standing before me and make sure that I handle that gift properly so that in the midst of handling them, I actually set them up for their future. It is what has been entrusted into my hands as those who lead in the body of Christ. Galatians talks about the mindset of how people shifted all because of culture. And the decree of Paul unto the Galatians is saying, how did you slip away so swiftly from the truth that you received? I saw you. I preached to you. I saw you being filled with the Holy Spirit. I saw how passionately your life was transformed. But all of a sudden, there is a subtlety that has crept in to make you believe that you got to earn salvation another way. Hear me. Anything that pulls us outside of the alignment of the true gospel. And true relationship with the Lord actually deadens us and causes us to serve another God. Hear that. If our time is not being occupied by the Lord, it's being occupied by something that's not him. There is no in-between. There is no neutrality in the realm of the spirit. There has to be either you love him or you don't. And whether that God is you, that just might be it. You might have made yourself into being like God by giving yourself more time than what you give to him. And I've been there. Can we be honest? I've been guilty of it. If nobody else is going to be honest in here, I will be the first one to raise my hand to say, I have been guilty in letting my first love fall to the ground. But swiftly, as I feel his presence nudging me to come up higher and to learn of him again, I repent and come back and say, Father, take me back. I thank you for your love. I thank you for awakening in me a desire and a passion and a pursuit to know you. I thank you that your whisper brings me to tears, that the very essence of your voice breaks me to the very core of my being. You are the one that I desire. You are my passion. You are the one that is the prize of everything that I love. Father, help me to love you the way that you desire. Give me a passion and a pursuit suit that I will only love you according to your plan. I don't want any other way of showing love. I don't want anybody else's methodology. But God, show me how you desire to be loved. What is your love language, Father? Ooh. Ooh. Hallelujah. Paul wrote in chapter 6, verse 11, See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. Meaning, see the emphasis that I'm putting to you so that you understand what this means. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised only that they may not suffer persecution for the sake of the cross. 
There are people that are trying to dumb down your relationship with God so that they feel more comfortable about where they are. But you can't allow people around you to keep you from his presence. You can't allow people around you who are not running after him to slow you down. But the passion and the pursuit that he's put inside of you is for your purpose. It's for your destiny. It's for every single person that you are meant to meet. Why? Because they're supposed to eat of the fruit that comes off of your tree. Because you have allowed your roots to grow deep in him and that he can pour in to make sure that your leaves will not wither and you will not cast your fruit before it's time. But everything that has been postured inside of you has been made to actually bring sustenance to a people who are hungry and thirsty and waiting for an encounter with a God that they do not know. But God forbid that I should boast except in, in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor, nor uncircumcision avails anything, but only a new creation. It doesn't matter if we go through the motions. It doesn't matter if we go through the place where we're just acting as if we got it together based on the spiritual connotation of what's acceptable today. Nothing matters unless you're being transformed. That is the measure of what it means to walk with him, that I'm no longer the same person that I've been. But every single time I encounter him, something about me changes. That every time I come in this place and I lift my hands in worship and tears run down my face and I lay myself at the altar and I cry out before him, I'm no longer the same person, but something moment by moment, day by day, second by second is being changed and transformed unto the image and the likeness of him. We come back into alignment with his preferences and his purpose for our lives by allowing him to deal with our hearts. We cast our crowns of intellect at his feet. We engage with the spirits of God, the seven spirits of God, spirit of the Lord, spirit of wisdom, understanding, knowledge, counsel, might, the fear of the Lord. We engage with the spirits of God so that what? We actually become like him and that the counsel of the Lord guides us as a tutor. He becomes the teacher. He becomes the one that actually shepherds us up, up, along the way in each step that we go. That we are not ignorant of anything, especially the wiles of the devil. <laughs> the world and its desires will pass away. But whoever does the will of God will what? Live forever. 1 John 2.17, and I know a lot of people are talking a lot of stuff, but guess what? There is a place that we can encounter God that we begin to rejuvenate. We begin to actually regenerate, and we get younger and younger. I know I'm talking crazy to some of y'all, but there is a place that I believe in God where everything that comes encounter with his presence, that we begin to walk. Why should the Old Testament people walk in something greater than what we did? Why should Enoch be able to walk with God so much until he got to the place, until he was no more? Why should he be the only one? Why should there be those who live to be 100 and 120 and 150 and 390 years and yet still don't see death? Why should they be able to do that? And they did not have Holy Spirit, but we have the presence of the living God on the inside of us. We are the temple of God. Why shouldn't we begin to move into things like that? And we look up down the road. They say, how did you make it to 120? I can show you my manuals of prayer. I can show you the days that I spent fasting, that the majority of my life I spent before the presence of God, that every morning I had counsel with the living God, with the wisdom of the Lord, that I spent time in his presence. I went into his counsel chamber and I got insight about what I needed to do with my body. I found out what I needed to do to shift the situation with my health. I found out how I needed to lose weight. I got in his presence until my DNA began to change. I got in his presence until my eyes began to see clearly, that I began to hear how things move and operate in the realm of the spirit until I manifested it in the natural. These are things that we have access to, but it's the place of our preference. It's the place of our push. It's the place of our desire that brings us into a place where we align with the promises of God for our lives. See, the principle is that we have to purpose in our heart. The Bible says, give as you have purposed in your heart to do so, not begrudgingly. But one who is what? A cheerful giver. Guess what? That's not just about money. That means your whole life. 
You present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service with great cheer and great joy. Too many times have we allowed there to be a false mindset concerning Christianity that I'm missing out on stuff. So I'm walking around like an angry believer because I feel like the world is having more fun than I am supposed to have. No, that is a lie from the pit of hell. My very desire is to encounter the king of glory, to encounter the creator of all the earth and find out things about him that the world has no mindset to be able to comprehend what happens when you find out uh, the very sciences of the earth without being a trained scientist. You find out why physics happen. You find out why quantum physics happen. You find out the laws to math and you begin to solve problems based on your encounter with the Lord. What happens when things line up according to the wisdom of God? You walk into boardrooms for fun. And make the experts stand in awe when they realize you have no understanding of what you're talking about. But you just get an answer by download. It comes by word of knowledge. And you stand up and you speak. This is the issue that's going on in your plant. This is the decree of the Lord about what you need to do. You don't understand that God speaks this way. But he's telling me if you change this and change that, that you will see revenue and increase by your third quarter. And you speak it with the authority of God. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, third quarter shows up. And they cut you a check for 5% of $5 million because you just saved them $5 million. And you find yourself operating in kingdom business principles. Ah, shit. Pick it up. I'm telling y'all, the Lord is releasing that anointing. He's releasing that anointing. Father, we thank you. You have to pray in the spirit. Hear me. We have discounted Holy Spirit and encounters with him. But the Bible tells us that we pray in the spirit and we speak mysteries unto the Lord. Things that we know not of. We actually set up our future by how we pray in the spirit. When we think about that, we actually have the ability to create a new beginning for us. A new beginning for us. Wherever there is a stagnation, wherever there is a stop. If we would just pause and pray in the spirit and then decree to that thing. You must bow according to the word of the Lord and what he's decreed by these tongues. By that which he is saying in the realm of the spirit. You may not even understand or interpret or comprehend what took place. But you know that God has shifted a moment. We are receiving from God. Lastly, these last two, we cry out to God for a heart of flesh. He said that if we would cry out for a heart of flesh, he would take the stony heart out of us, right? But he won't just give us a heart of flesh that's blank. He actually said that I'm going to write on the tablet of your heart and your mind my commandments that you may know my ways. He doesn't want you to be ignorant of the ways of how he moves, but he desires to put a cheat sheet on the inside of you that you can reference every single time you need to. Father, what is it that you're up to? What is it that you're changing? What is it that you're developing? What is it that you're moving? What has to change? What doesn't have to change? What can remain the way it is? And what must you shake until nothing else remains but the very thing that you said? <laughs> Lastly, you commit your ways to the Lord. The preparations of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirits. Commit your works to the Lord. And your thoughts will be established. The Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the very wicked for the day of evil. Proverbs 16, 9, a man's heart plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. He who heeds the word wisely will find good. And whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. The wise in heart will be called prudent and sweetness of lips increases learning. So when you utter what the Lord says, he is the one that is sweeter than a honeycomb. He is the one that the decrees of his mouth become the essence of joy to you. When you hear them, it's like choice morsels going down into the depths of your belly. It's not sour, but it's nothing but sweetness that brings you into a newfound joy. There is a way that seems right. But when we follow him, it actually aligns us out of the way that we've been going. When we find our plans, 19 Proverbs 19, 21, many other plans in a man's heart, but the counsel of the what? Lord will stand. When we say, God, I don't trust my own wisdom. I don't know enough. I don't have the answer. But Father, you do. 
I desire your presence so that I can have your counsel. I desire to sit at your feet so that you can teach me. Father, I come to you in what childlike faith. I'm not even going to say, God, I could be working in this job for 20 years, but you know what? Every single morning, I'm going to sit at your feet and say, teach me again. I don't know enough, God. Father, I'm in a place where it seems like I've gained some ground, but Lord, there's always more. So I will sit at your feet and I will humble myself under your mighty hand that you can trust me with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. That I will never be in a place where I'm ignorant concerning the things that I need to know. But as you unlock to me the treasure of your mind, I thank you that all truth is making me free. It's bringing me into an existence with you that nothing can deny me what you have set up for my life. Stand to your feet. Praise him if you'll come. Reban soko ramai tere le man shuto raman si adere be koshi atamaya Oh God tere le ma koshari adere le man so Thank you for newfound hunger Thank you for newfound passion. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Father, we recommit our lives unto you. We recommit our passions unto you. We recommit our desires unto you. We recommit everything, Lord God. Our preferences, Father. We yield our preferences to your direction. We no longer, Lord God, look at things from the mindset in the eyes that we have seen. But God, we relinquish our lordship unto you, the only wise, true, and living God. We relinquish control of our lives, control of our desires to the one that desires to make us like him. Father, we say yes this morning. We shift our direction. We shift our perspective. We take it off the problem and we set our gaze upon you. We find you again, oh God. We find you again. Yes, Lord. Father, we repent this morning for every place that we've let our gaze slip that we've looked at problems greater than we've looked at the solution. We look, Lord God, more to the issue than we did the one, Lord God, that brings the change. Father, we empty, Lord God, the gates of our lives. We empty our eye gates, Lord God, from judging according to the eyes of what we see. You said, Lord God, that man looks on the outward appearance, but you look upon the heart. Father, we shift our perspective to look upon the heart again. We look, Lord God, that we may judge things righteously by your spirit. That we would only see things the way that you see them. That we would only speak over things the way that you have spoken concerning them. That we would not speak an end, Lord God, until you say so. Father, we thank you this morning that you're bringing us into a place of greater alignment, greater truth, greater perspective, greater, Lord God, understanding of how we are to be. We thank you, Father, that you're changing our hunger. But where our, our, our hearts have hungered for the things that have been carnal. You said, Father, if we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we shall be filled. Father, I thank you for a download of fresh hunger. That as your servants, those who have given their lives over to you as bond servants, willfully submitting to your will. God, we say, fill us the more. Father, as this worship is lifted, Lord God, unto you, ah, we thank you, Father, that each heart is having a transaction. Father, that you're removing the stony heart and you're writing on the tablet of our hearts and our minds and you're giving us a heart of flesh. Yes, Lord, a heart that says yes to you no matter what. A heart that yields to your direction, Lord God, in the midst of pain and frustration. A heart, Lord God, that surrenders. No longer taking control, no longer defending oneself. Hallelujah, but trusting your ways because we know you. We thank you. Hey, we cast our crowns at your feet, Lord God. We join with the 20 and 4 elders. And we cast our crowns at your feet, Father. Every crown of intellect, Lord God, every crown of position. Father, we lay our scepters and our robes at your feet, God. Hey. Your presence. 
some of us you've shown us where we have prejudices as we laid them at the altar this morning we say consume it Lord God you search our hearts father don't let us get away with justifying Lord God things by our own mindset but Lord perfect us perfect us perfect us we lay it at the altar we lay it at the altar to be consumed in your holy fire. Refine us today. Refine us today. Hey, yes, Lord. Let your love come in like a river. Father, let it overtake us, overwhelm us. Expand our capacity to receive your love. Expand our capacity to receive of you.
Father, we thank you for your presence. And we've committed ourselves unto you again. I thank you, Father, for convicting our hearts, bringing us back into a place of right standing and right alignment with you, for dealing with every preference that was out of place, for realigning our desires with what you desire, our passions, Lord God, with your will. Father, we honor you for every soul that is here. Father, for those who do not know you but has felt your presence, I thank you for a life-transforming encounter. That now the courage is there to say yes to you for real. Father, we give you honor that this house belongs to you. That we as a people, we belong to you. That your plans are what's best for us. We choose to navigate according to your direction. Father, we give you praise. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and forever. We put your purpose above everything else. We give you honor that you supply us with what we need to fulfill that purpose for the glory of your name. I ask you, Father, with the grace that you placed on my life, that you will birth afresh intimacy with every person under the sound of my voice, that there are doors that are being opened for intimate encounters with you, that they will know what it is, Lord God, to feel you, to know you, to see you. Father, I pray specifically, Lord God, that they would have encounters in the night season as we've dealt with dreams, visions, discernment. But Father, I ask for an increase concerning their experience with the counsel of the living God. Let there be invitations into your counsel that each one may receive what is needed for purpose and destiny. That at the obedience, at one instruction, lives change forever. We give you honor. We thank you for this place, that we are a people that desire to abide in you, that your word may abide in us, that we can ask what we will be given to us by our Father, which is in heaven. We honor you. We love you. We adore you. We thank you for this moment. We mark it in the realm of the Spirit. The day that our hearts said yes again, and life hit our bodies because we engaged with the living God. We give you praise and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just celebrate him. You can lift your voice. You can clap. You can sing. Yes, Lord. Hey, come get this past Alex. Just go out in thanksgiving to Pastor Samuel for delivering that word and laboring before the Lord to get it. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, you know, one thing is we always look at it as delivering the word. We thank Pastor Samuel for delivering the word, but we want to thank him also for laboring to receive the word. Amen. You get that time to get along that God could, could minister to you. But you know, one thing Pastor Samuel talked about, prejudice. And you know, Jesus came to destroy that because through Jesus came the, pro came the uh, promise, the great mystery that the Patriots was looking forward to was that great mystery about salvation would he come to the Gentiles. Amen? That Jesus Christ came, suffered, that they might 
have access. Amen. And for us uh, as well. Because the veil of the temple was split in two, we had access to come to the Lord. Amen. Praise God. You know, in this atmosphere, I, I, I don't want to make assumptions because we may have someone here with us today that you have not received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and appropriated by faith all the benefits that you have access through. Amen. He made it all possible. So we want to extend an opportunity, not only to those of you here in the sanctuary, but you who are with us by live stream. What promises he gave for us? The word said, as many as believed on him, he gave them the right to become sons and daughters of God. And at Life Center, we family oriented. We talk about take care of family, but we want to make sure not only you belong in a Life Center family, but you are in the family of God. Amen? So we're going to pray. Amen? And we're going to take part and take hold of this promise. Amen? If you would pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for revealing the mystery that through your son Jesus Christ, all men can be saved. Today, Lord Jesus, I confess I need a savior. Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that you are my savior. And today, I confess you as Lord. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Cleanse me from my sins. Fill me with your spirit. And guide me through life as a testimony of your love. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you for my hope. And thank you for the promises of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. What a wonderful start of the journey. If you're joining us by live stream and you just prayed that prayer, why don't you hit us up, send us a little note at salvationatlifecenter.org that we can work with you, that we can walk alongside you in your new walk, in your new journey into uh, the kingdom of God. And if you're here in the sanctuary, we have our pastors here. We have two pastors sitting around the front. Pastor Darrell is sitting in here, and Pastor Charles. And if you just received the Lord Jesus Christ and your Savior, they're going to be available to you to help you in that walk. Amen? Because we don't want you to walk alone. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Man, since I'm so freely throwing out invitations, I think now is the time that we, we are a growing church, we are a training church, we are a serving church, and some of you may be here without a church home where you worship, a place that you feel part, a family that you belong to. Today I'm extending an invitation to you to come into the family of Life Center. If you feel or believe that the Lord is tugging up on your heart, that this is the place you need to be, we want to receive you right now. We have a new members reception team. They're stationed over there to the doors to my left, and there's someone also in the welcome center. They want to receive you to process as you in as members of the family of God, because we want to welcome you in and uh, become a part of the family. So if that's you, you could gather your belongings or walk around the side or just walk over here. They're waiting over there to receive you and also be over there as well. Amen. To greet you. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Can everybody say amen? We had a wonderful time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We just want to make sure to let you all know that if some of you all still need prayer, we're going to call the altar ministers up in the front in a minute, and they'll be here to pray with you after the services, uh, 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 when the services are dismissed. And I would hope that all of us will uh, remember to be quiet in here uh, when that starts so they can uh, be effective in their, their prayer. For our first-time guest, 
uh, I would ask that you would take your uh, guest card and out these doors to your left, someone will escort you over there as well. Matter of fact, I'll even do it if I get down here fast enough. We want you to go over there. Our senior leaders will be there and some of the leaders to greet you in the Welcome Center. We just want to say hi, bless you, and maybe say a prayer over you as well. So take your little card and uh, walk over to the, to the Welcome Center. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Is someone over there? If anybody want to go, we get somebody at that door. They'll be over there to guide you, okay? Don't forget to get your children and a copy of today's message. Wasn't that powerful? Yeah. Amen. Please don't forget your children. Please pick them up. I know you're under the anointing. Amen. But praise God. Take charge of your spirit and don't forget your children. If you do forget them, we will pro provide them with an excellent little puppy, two dozen of donuts, one Coke. And you won't do that forever again. Amen. We just want to tell you that we love you. We appreciate you because we're going to stand up and be dismissed. Oh, my goodness. I just forgot about something. Ah. Elder James, you shouldn't have let me do that. I put charge you with that, my brother. Okay. Never let this happen again. I'm sorry. But Apostle Bud and, and Dr. Mary gave me the authority to do this. I didn't tell you. We love you. Amen. We love you. We're just not saying this as a joke. We love you, and we want you to feel the love in this house because we TCOF here, okay? Amen. We love you. Praise God. Amen. But guess what? Our love is minuscule to the love of, that God has for you. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful time today, Master. Father, we were tremendously blessed. Oh, how our hearts rejoiced as we sang the praises unto your name. And Father, you loved us enough, Lord, that you would send your love through one of your spokesmen, Lord, to bless us today, Lord, to put us on the right track, Lord, to give us a greater victory in you. And Father, now, Lord God, I thank you for your people, that they are called the righteous, Master. And Father, Lord, your eye is upon the righteous. You guide them. You lead them, Father. You bless them. You protect them with your mighty hand, Father. Lord, you give them provisions, oh God, and you care for them. So, Father, we speak blessing over your people, the call the righteous today. Father, may they go in peace. May they go in joy, Father. Grant them great success in every endeavor that their hands find to do, Master. And Father, we'll look once again to come into the house of God to rejoice next week in your presence. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when you're going outside, why don't you encourage somebody before you leave? Turn around to a brother and sister and say, hey, listen, I appreciate you. I love you. Bless somebody. Amen.